Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation's Ask the Expert series. We're thrilled to have you join us today for this wonderful educational program brought to you by the Curonim Initiative in Castle Biosciences. My name is Lauren Johnston, Senior Program Officer with the Melanoma Research Foundation. I'm so thrilled that you're all here to learn about the results from genetic testing by Dr. Peter Hovland and to also speak with the Zubek family. I'd love to share a little bit about the MRF and the CuroM initiative for this month of November. This month is the MRF's CuroM initiative. They were reporting our national awareness campaign, which is hashtag I get dilated, which is in honor of Eye Health Awareness Month. Over 2000 Americans are diagnosed each year with ocular melanoma or melanoma of the eye. It is the second most common form of melanoma. Getting a dilated eye exam yearly is a critical way to diagnose OM early, as well as promote eye health as part of an annual wellness visit. I'd also like to highlight our symposium. This month, we're excited to educate our community and we have several events, including the Ask the Expert series that you're watching today. The big one is happening right now. It's our MRF's Cure OM Initiative's Eyes on a Cure Patient and Caregiver Global Symposium. It's November 19th through the 21st, so today is the first day. This three-day event focuses on providing opportunities for education, support, and connection for the ocular melanoma patient and caregiver community. Five organizations from three continents have come together to plan and facilitate this event, a first for QRM and for the global ocular melanoma community. Some examples of the sessions include updates on adjuvant therapy, effects of radiation, COVID-19 and OM clinical trials, and a CureOM vision registry update and more. You can still register for the free symposium by visiting CureOM.org. Education is critical for patients making informed decisions about their, about their care. We are thrilled to partner with Castle Biosciences on the Ask the Experts series, which is touching on topics to help educate and empower the ocular melanoma community. Today is our third session in the series and we'll be focused on explaining genetic testing results. This session is streamed live to the MRF's Facebook page, but will be available after as part of our video library that you can share. We encourage people to use the comments section to ask questions, which will be addressed at the end of today's session. The information presented during today's session is for educational purposes. Any treatment questions should be directed to your healthcare provider and your treatment team. We would encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to learn more about the resources we have available for our OM patients and caregivers. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Hopland. He is a renowned ophthalmologist specializing in macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, vitro retinal surgical conditions, and ocular oncology. Dr. Hovland leads Colorado Retina's ocular oncology department and strives to engage in cutting edge research and activism around research funding to improve treatment for all of his patients. His special focus on surgical and medical treatment for intraocular tumors includes ocular melanoma, choroidal or iris nevus, choroidal metastatic and other retinal conditions. Currently, he serves as a grant reviewer for the MRF and is an advocate for the CuroM initiative. Thank you, Dr. Hovland, for being here today and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see. And I assume this is playing well. Does this look good, Lauren? Thank you. Thanks for asking. And um, I hope you find the following few minutes interesting. You know, the topic of genetic testing of uveal melanoma can be as big as you like. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to try and compress it into just under 10 minutes here kind of an overview, and then we can have a discussion afterwards. Um, I am gonna be presenting the test that we use in our clinic uh, really almost exclusively, which is the uh, system by Castle Biosciences. And so I wanna be clear that uh, I need to make that disclaimer. And yet I think I can justify, uh, you'll see why the talk, uh, it, during the course of the talk, why uh, we have chosen to use this. It's just, uh, um, let's see. There we go. So I have uh, worked and been involved with the Castle Biosciences over the last uh, number of years, serving both on their scientific advisory panel. Also, they've been uh, very generous sponsors of the Coog and Coog 2 trials. 
And um, I'm an investigator with that group, and this will come out here in the talk. So uh, to introduce a little bit, I've been taking care of melanoma patients for quite a while. And our practice in Denver was involved initially with the COMS study. And uh, as such, uh, we've inherited uh, a um, re uh, capacity as a referral center. And uh, so we have patients in the Western States region who, um, who come to us and we every year see many, many patients. We focus uh, exclusively on intraocular tumors. And of course, um, I'm using the term uveal melanoma. I think I may go back and forth between it and the term ocular melanoma, but I'm referring really to intraocular tumors, not conjunctival melanoma today. Um, and I'm thankful to have had uh, opportunities to learn from many, many patients. And uh, as a center, we've had a, a large exposure to the wide variety of how this disease, disease can present. And many, many patients and all of you have uh, helped contribute to make a practice which hopefully continues to benefit the wide majority of patients. Okay, so living with the decisions. You've been diagnosed with melanoma. There's a lot of things uh, you have to think about pretty quickly. And one of the first questions you get is, should you get a genetic test or not? And so this is very early on in the disease course, typically for folks. They've had a new diagnosis, ocular melanoma. That's turned your life upside down. And you've got to think about what kind of treatment you're going to have, uh, staging, what kind of other imaging studies you have. And then also on top of it, this genetic test. And um, you're, you're asked to make these decisions rather quickly. Um, this is kind of a, this is a, a overview, hopefully, to distill it into its uh, most basic elements. Looking at uveal melanoma right away, we know it's a threat to the eyesight. And then, of course, uh, the more daunting aspect of it is that 50% of patients um, have a chance of developing metastatic disease. And uh, unfortunately, right now, there's no definitive cure for that uh, condition. Um, the testing will help us assess the risk uh, of developing metastatic disease. These tests are based on very sophisticated um, DNA technologies, and the mathematics that are used to describe them are statistical, and they can be somewhat uh, slippery uh, to and, and interpret and apply to your, your own condition. In general, though, we identify patients so, uh, by these tests into two groups. We could sort them into high-risk groups and low-risk groups. Keep in mind the science continues to evolve. The tests we're doing today are, are being um, uh, explored even deeper with uh, research projects. And in five years from now, we may have a very different understanding of, of what we're doing. Um, so again, why do we do it? We do the test to stratify the risk in terms of prognosis. And this has implications when it comes to clinical decision-making. If you end up in a high-risk group, this creates an opportunity for you to join a adjuvant trial where there's clinical research looking at preventing the development development of metastatic disease if you're known to have a high risk genotype. Some patients also find that knowing this allows them to plan their personal lives and prioritize uh, their decisions. And simply some people don't wanna have the test and that's still okay not to have the test. When we look at the history of genetic testing, it's been around for a while, last century, there was a, a lot of things done with microscopes. We looked at uh, cytology and looked at chromosomes and scientists discovered that, um, that monosomy three, a chromosomal condition um, was associated with a high risk of developing metastatic disease. And for years that was the standard. Um, in more modern times now we have, uh, uh, due to the large advances made with uh, uh, DNA technology, we have much more sophisticated tests available to, to answer questions regarding um, the uh, genetic predilection for uh, metastatic disease. The uh, Coog study was based, um, was, was structured to validate the testing which is used by Castle Biosciences. And it uses a technology called gene expression profiling. I'm not gonna go into the technical details, but the initial study showed that there were two classes when it came to metastatic disease. This, uh, this slide, uh, summary, summarizes the data. It was a, a collaborative effort nationally involving 12 centers. We were lucky to be part of that. And um, we, we could see that uh, there were two classes that have a distinct uh, uh, metastatic free survival. And you can see the blue curve uh, shows the class one, which has a more favorable prognosis, whereas clearly the class two patients have a higher risk as a group collectively of developing metastatic disease. I do wanna make a, a comment real quickly on this here. 
I do have several patients in my practice now who have had uh, class two, um, were, were identified as class two patients and they're very much alive and healthy now, uh, almost a decade later. So again, statistical arguments here, but nevertheless, we can see a significant difference in the clinical outcome of these patients as uh, identified with this testing. So as the knowledge evolved, uh, we realized that class one could be split into two groups, class 1A and class B. And just to summarize um, in a non-quantitative fashion, but a qualitative fashion, the class 1A group is the lowest of risk. Class 1B is thought to have a medium risk and class two is the higher risk outcome of the testing. The NCCN, National Comprehensive Care Network, has, has um, employed the use of this classification system uh, when they describe factors which would be associated with low, medium, and high risk. Uh, enumerated here, you can see other, um, um, uh, other qualifications that may be used for risk classification as well. This uh, has clinical significance in that these guidelines, uh, uh, guidelines have been developed in terms of surveillance. If you have a class 1A, um, for example, uh, you should consider having imaging every 12 months. And again, we're looking for metastatic disease. Um, class 1B, every six to 12 months for 10 years. Class two, um, the imaging as we might imagine would be more intensive every three to six months for five years, or, and then every six to 12 months thereafter. Also, as I mentioned earlier, this classification allows us to not only affect the clinical management, but it opens up op option to enroll in a, what's called an adjuvant trial. Adjuvant is a word meaning in addition. So once the eye has been treated, even in the absence of metastatic disease, you might enroll in a clinical trial for treatment, which would be designed to prevent the um, occurrence of metastatic disease. We've learned some lessons from, being partic from participation in COOG. First of all, we learned that tumor biopsies can be done safely and reliably. And this, prior to the Coog study, or the Coog study uh, tumor biopsies were fairly rare across the country. Now it appears to be the, the standard of care as we've determined it is safe. Also, we found that the risk of metastatic disease is dependent on the genetics of the tumor. And this is consistent with earlier models that have been proposed, showing that metastatic risk is independent of the way your eye is treated. This implies that the actual metastasis, or sometimes I will say subclinical metastasis, can occur before the diagnosis of the eye condition. This has allowed us to also expand the way we clinically manage risk and more efforts now are put into sparing the eye and working to enhance the function of the eye because we know we're able to proceed and this does not affect the risk, uh, which is due to genetics. Now, the future. There are more genes that are involved. And um, the COOG-2 study, which is now enrolled, uh, enrolling more patients, um, and I'll explain that in a moment, ha has been launched to investigate some of the new knowledge that has come out. Um, as you can see in the central um, graph there, are the uh, progression-free survival, there are four lines here, which include the class class um, one and two, but also overlaying a gene called PRAME, which we're interested in studying. Now we can see instead of having two curves, there's four curves. Um, which curve are you on? It becomes more complicated. It's not as simple as one and two anymore. Um, on the right um, is the um, diagram showing a model for how these new genes may be influencing the progression of melanoma in the eye. And I'm not going to explain this, but just to show you that the model is becoming more and more complex. The COOG-2 study has actually, I think, completed enrollment. 800 patients is the largest database of its kind in the world. And this data is being collected as we speak. And we hope in the near future to be able to describe more accurately the utility of measuring for these other mutations in the eye frame, as well as other genes. So again, I just want to summarize in our practice, it seems like I'm talking, maybe even it seems like I'm giving an advertisement for Castle Biosciences. There are other testing modalities out there, but I'm most familiar with this Castle Biosciences uh, platform uh, because of our participation in the COOG study, um, studies. We've also 
chosen to employ it on all of our patients that are not in the study so that when the data does ultimately come out, we're going to be able to extrapolate the findings to our patient population. And I would also suggest that the um, uh, Castle Biosciences nationally has become the standard of care with probably 90% of the clinics using this testing modality. I'm um, getting close to the end here. Just wanna uh, touch on a subject which is very important. Um, when you're making a decision to have the test, we have to realize that uh, not only does it affect the clinical activity, but it, it, it involves your psyche. And the, the, the result can have a profound implication on your sense of well being and your sense of yourself. Um, with an awareness of that in mind, I was very uh, proud to have uh, my assistant, uh, Amanda Cisco, in our office here at Colorado Retina Associates take the initiative to collaborate with the Melanoma Research Foundation in the University of Denver to develop an Ocular Melanoma Support Alliance, which creates an audience where patients can discuss um, together the impacts of the disease and the genetic testing on their lives. So we have patient navigation, advocacy, and um, I think counseling is an important part of any genetic tests. And so we're always looking to fill in the gaps where we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hovland. Um, I just want to just briefly mention two things that you that you said um, before we go on, and that was one, um, you discussed that uh, everyone's cancer journey is different in that statistics are statistics. And so I really just appreciate that focus. Um, and then the second one, just highlighting uh, the patient um, emotional well being. I think that that's a huge piece that sometimes can be often overlooked. So I just want to thank you um, for the, both of those. Um, and now I would love to introduce Lindsay and Paul Zubek. Um, they are our patient and caregiver family. In 2017, Lindsay was diagnosed with ocular melanoma. She and her husband, Paul, have had firsthand experiences regarding the CASEL test and using those results to assist in their treatment journey um, with Dr. Hovland, which is a really great opportunity to have you all here today. Um, and I just wanted to, to touch base with them and let them kind of share what it's been like uh, as a patient and a caregiver. So uh, to get things started, Lindsay, I'm gonna start with you. Um, can you tell us about when you were diagnosed and received those genetic testing results and how you might have processed them at the time and how they have have overall impacted your treatment journey. Hey, Lauren, can you hear me okay? Awesome. So when I was diagnosed with um, OM, I was 34 and I had three little kids and uh, working full time. So really daily life was full of so many unknowns. And if there was something that I could um, grab onto, something I can control, I definitely wanted to. So once I decided on my initial treatment plan, uh, Dr. Hovland and Amanda shared the, um, the castle biopsy option um, and also their medical expertise on the why, the what, and the recommendations, um, and, and ultimately that the biopsy would happen at the first time of my initial surgery. So once I learned um, more, and Dr. Hovland kind of shared um, some of the statistics and you know, this is like a safe, reliable biopsy um, kind of with me from my initial treatment. It was, it was kind of really like a no-brainer to um, move forward with the, the biopsy. I wanted to know from the get-go what I was dealing with um, and, and ultimately just to be able to be the best advocate for myself and really to get others to be an advocate for me, especially if I got the bad news, which I would consider like the highest risk in um, you know, the aggressive form of metastatic disease. So unfortunately the news that I got was not the news that I wanted. Um, my surgeon had called and shared that I was class two, prime negative. Um, and class two, as Dr. Hovland referenced earlier, means the most aggressive form of ocular melanoma with the greatest statistical chance of metastatic disease. So. Um, as you can imagine, and as those that are on this call as well, getting, you know, their results, um, there was lots of moments of, of sadness, of anger, um, anxiety, like kicked in to, to full gear for sure. Um, but I, um, after I kind of gathered myself together, I went into self-advocate mode. 
and worked really closely with Dr. Hoblin, um, Amanda, my patient advocator, and uh, my medical oncologist to ultimately agree on my scan surveillance um, because I know I needed, you know, an aggressive treatment plan. Um, also, like what options could I do to move forward? And being class two, um, you know, I had learned that there were a few adjunctive clinical trials out there. So I chose to enroll in one of the adjunctive clinical trials. And that was um, with the amazing Dr. Carvajal up in Columbia U um, and began ultimately traveling to New York City monthly for that. Unfortunately, a few months after um, you know, I started that uh, clinical trial, it was negatively impacting my liver. Um, we tried different dosages and, and different options, but ultimately, um, you know, if OM is going to metastasize, one of the first places that it, it could possibly go is the liver. And I knew I needed to keep my liver um, as healthy as possible, and I couldn't take the risk, you know, just with the event of preventing metastatic disease. So I resigned from the trial, um, left in tears. Um, for those of you that know Dr. Carvajal um, personally or his team, they were really nothing but amazing to myself. Um, also, my dad and my grandmother kind of tag team traveling with me to New York City. So forever grateful um, for them, their support kind of through that journey as well. But um, I, I resigned from that clinical trial, but ultimately knew um, there was other options out there. And I have kind of told myself since day one, you know, I'm class two, the, the rate of metastasis could be super high, but if there's options, there's hope. And I had to keep jumping on to whatever hope that I had. And so I actually worked with my medical oncologist to uh, get on the other clinical trial um, treatment, uh, chemotherapy drug, um, Sutent, and um, was able to get on that outside of the study. So big piece here, like be an advocate, you know, for yourself as much as you can and continue to look into options and like challenge the norm of what possibly could be out there, you know, for you. So the good news is this drug did not impact my labs um, and I was able to continue on it for many months. Uh, it definitely impacted and I had some crazy side effects that bless my husband Paul's heart. <laughs> he kind of dealt with me on, on all those side effects. But, um, you know, with, with having the high rate of metastatic disease, I have um, a, a very aggressive cadence of scans as Dr. Hoblin kind of recommended um, earlier and, and shared earlier. I have MRIs of my liver every three months. I have um, chest CTs every six months. And then in 2018, I actually had enucleation. And now I have um, MRIs of my orbits every three months as well. So my surveillance plan is very aggressive, but you know, luckily I'm aware of kind of what my class is and I'm able to um, kind of do the surveillance plan that I feel most comfortable with. So, Long story short, you know, my, um, my journey has been nothing short of, you know, or our journey really has been nothing short of a, a full emotional roller coaster, but knowing my class and, um, you know, I feel really blessed that I was able to have the options and, and fully informed of what my options were with the biopsy. It definitely opened a lot of doors to me um, and I was able to really kick it into like advocate mode and have control over what I could control with this, you know, really really horrible cancer um, that, that I'm living with. Thanks, Lindsay. That sounds like such um, a roller coaster journey so far, um, but also glad that things are stable. Um, and just having your perspective, I think, is going to give a lot of patients, like you were saying, that hope. So thank you for, for that. And Paul, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is National Caregivers Month. So um, thank you for being such an amazing caregiver with Lindsay. Um, I just have a question. In regards to that caregiver role, how did the genetic testing impact to you? Like, was it information that you felt necessary to have in order to support Lindsay um, in her treatment options? What was, what was that like for you? No, I, I, I definitely thought it was very important because it helped provide a, uh, a known variable for a, a condition that has so many unknowns. And uh, especially knowing she was a, uh, a high risk of metastatic disease, uh, you know, we wanted to um, make sure that we were being as aggressive as, as possible in getting her the treatment, you know, needed to, um, you know, secure her health. And uh, being able to have a plan help provide a uh, level of comfort for, for all of us and probably for, for Lindsay knowing that, you know, um, you know, when she was taken off and uh, everything at home 
with our three kids was under control and um, come back and everything, the house was still standing um, and being able to get the treatment she needed. So um, yeah, I feel very fortunate and um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we have a lot of questions. Um, so I just wanna start kicking those off first and, and Dr. Hovland um, would love to, to ask you one, um, one or two actually. Sure. So um, one of the questions was depending on where you biopsy the tumor, um, can you get a different result for your class? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think the, the prevailing opinion is no. It's probably an accurate test as it's done. Uh, the phraseology I've heard is that it's a sample of the environment. So it's, um, it's been validated uh, scientifically. So we feel very confident it's an accurate test. Uh, but um, there are still some questions that remain. Uh, for example, could it switch from a class one to a class two? We don't, we feel like the evolution of a tumor uh, probably doesn't go from a class one to two, but there are still some areas of debate. So I would say um, maybe a 2% chance that uh, the biopsy might be inaccurate, but uh, in terms of its biopsy, but uh, the location within the tumor. But that's why we all endeavor to do a technique that ensures we are getting the best sample possible. And um, one of the limitations to the, the biopsy technique is that it's kind of a one and done deal. I, it would be great to come back later and repeat the biopsy and say, hey, are, are we sure this is right? Are we sure it's a class two? Um, but um, so we, uh, uh, there's some thought that perhaps on the margins, there may be an error of that nature. And yet we do have the DNA. And now for a number of years, Castle Biosciences has been keeping a repository on the testing. So as questions develop in the future, we can go back to the original biopsy and retest them if needed. And part of the KUG2 study is to develop a um, biopsy that will have internal controls, if you will, that will convincingly show that we have obtained the specimen we're after. So I would say in general, we don't think about it too much, but it's a, it's a legitimate question. Great, thank you. Um, and I know that uh, most people will say that if you have had um, treatment before a biopsy, um, that oftentimes the genetic testing uh, is not available. But if someone were to have the biopsy but not go for the genetic testing right away, but then after um, some type of radiation treatment, they then decide to have the genetic test, is that still available? Um, I think you would have to talk with your uh, provider about that. If it's done, it may be done at the time the plaque is removed. And I know there's a number of physicians doing that. Um, when we do this study, and again, I want to emphasize um, the very importance of these clinical trials. These provide scientifically accurate information for us to use in decision making. When we look at individuals, there's this and that, there's a very unique uh, circumstances, location of the tumor size and whatnot. And, and yet uh, the, the science behind the studies is reliable. So um, um, I hope that answers your question. I, yeah, so. no, that was, that was great, thank you. Um, and I have a question, I think it's a two part, one for Dr. Hovland and then Lindsay, I would love your perspective on this. Um, one of the questions is, is testing covered by insurance? Um, and Lindsay, I, I don't know if you want to speak to that as well. So first to Dr. Hovland, uh, maybe you can tell us about caudal retina. And then Lindsay, if you can tell us um, if you had any roadblocks with the testing on your end of the patient. Well, if I could just actually finish a little bit more uh, on, on the earlier question. Oh, there absolutely. About I'm so sampling sorry. After radiation, I, I didn't get to it properly. There are some that will do that. I'll say that. And the idea is perhaps that it's safer to biopsy the tumor after it's been killed, so to speak, with radiation. And we're looking at that, but the KUG trials, we did not do that. The samples were taken prior to the radiation treatment. So again, if we're being conservative in the way we apply our knowledge, we stay within the methodology that was used with the KUG uh, trials. And that's been our bias, I'll admit. Um, intriguingly, there has been some evidence that you can biopsy these tumors after radiation treatment. However, I would suggest that just due to the nature of these studies, we're looking at what we call gene expression Gene expression is performed by viable cells. 
And over time after radiation, the cells will degenerate. Moreover, they have responses to the radiation, which causes the gene expression to change. And so this is a variable I would be very cautious about interpreting results that were done on an eye post radiation. Perhaps in the future though, we may evolve to that. And so we'll keep our eye on that. That would be preferable in a theoretical fashion. And yet the biopsy of live tumors appears to be safe. There's not really, uh, there's very low occurrence of what we call needle track seeding, meaning the biopsy itself produces a spread of the tumor within the eye. That's thought to be a very rare event. So is there really a need to be doing this after radiation? That could be debated. Now, I'm sorry, your question again was about- It was about insurance. I just wanted to know, oh, um, no. do, for from your perspective um, and, and what Colorado Retina Associates does, no. is it's covered by insurance. And then for yes. Lindsay, what was that like as a patient and having to get that covered? I would just say, yes, we, we, do, we do work to get it covered. And Castle Bioscience has been very generous and very helpful in establishing the clinical utility of this. What this means is if you're in a low risk group, you may not need as intensive imaging afterwards. And this saves the insurance company money. So you could actually create a financial argument that's pretty sound, that the testing overall is helpful, not only for medicine, but also for the insurance company because it allows them to focus their efforts where they're truly needed. And I'll stop at that. Yeah, and Lauren, just to, to piggyback, um, you know, uh, definitely, I did not pay anything um, out of pocket um, for that. Um, but again, going back to being an advocate and, you know, Dr. Hoblin and his team really helped me overcome some of those as well. So just to continue to work with your um, provider and how they can support you in navigating really that, that insurance world. It is so complicated and so confusing and frustrating sometimes, but finding those, um, you know, experts to really help navigate um, some of that, that red tape for you to get you through those challenging insurance type questions. Great, thank you. Um, so we're having a, a couple of questions coming in, Dr. Hovland, about um, the Castle test and other tests um, that maybe people had used. And, and so one of them, um, one of the questions was, if they did not have the Castle test, but a different genetic test that determined that they were class two, um, is there still a way to assess the chance um, of being um, within the five-year time frame of developing metastatic disease? Um, and then also um, they threw in the component of being prime negative. So is that a, a difficult stance for, for doctors to have um, when you meet with a patient and they maybe didn't do the test that you do like at Colorado Retina, but they have this other test and how do you move forward with surveillance and working with that patient? Well, this is a good question. And I think most of us will answer that, choose to answer the question in, in somewhat of a more vague fashion. Again, low risk or high risk is a good way to think about it, I think. There's other testing modalities. Let's take, for example, if you'd had chromosome three testing and you were shown to be monosomy three, that's a pretty good indicator that you are in the high risk group. And I think that's reliable enough to say, I'm a high risk patient. And many adjuvant trials would accept that as a entry criteria. So it's not exclusive to Castle. There's other studies out there. I think we're all looking at the same thing, which is prediction of, of high risk versus low risk. Now, there are, as, uh, to flesh out the comment about statistical arguments, you know, physicians, we look at populations of patients, whereas individuals, they have their own risk. And it's almost a binary process. I'm either good or I'm not good. It's A or B. And um, you can dwell on the math, but I don't know if it makes a big difference if I said a 63% chance versus a 62% chance. I don't know that that is meaningful to a patient. There are some effort, um, interesting on-site risk calculator, something called LUMPO from uh, Liverpool University. And you can go online and find that and enter your own data and all your testing. And it will give you a calculated value of what your current risk is of developing metastatic disease, including your age and how long it's been since you were diagnosed, et cetera. So these, these arguments can get pretty tenuous. And yet um, I understand the de desire to know, am I 90% you know, past my risk and these sort of things. I think that knowledge will be forthcoming as we go. Uh, we're still learning about these classifications. And uh, even though this has been around for 10 years and as exciting as the knowledge is, there's still a lot to be learned about that. So I, I would just say uh, if, if you're high risk by another form of testing, it's very likely would have been you know, corroborated by a test with the CASEL system and you 
could safely assume that you're probably a class two. Um, but there's other things that go into it, the size of the tumor, the location of the tumor. And these are factors that are also very, very important. Larger tumors have higher risk. Tumors that involve ciliary body are higher risks. So even just having one of those features alone could qualify you as a high risk patient. Okay, great. So just knowing that um, that the two would probably equal. Um, so a patient can, can kind of just assume like if I'm class two in this one, I'm also going to be class two on that one um, and to work with their with their team. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could possibly explain the difference in surveillance for someone who might be um, a class two prime negative versus a class two prime positive. You know, that's a good one. That's kind of um, uh, the data that was uh, published in the article that I referenced there. Uh, collaborative group uh, with Dr. Harbour and colleagues had demonstrated that a PRAME positivity increased the risk of metastatic disease for both class one and class two patients. So um, I think initially the thought process was that the, the PRAME positivity explained the more rare development of metastatic disease in a class one, a traditionally low risk patient. As we know, class one patients do sometimes come down with metastatic disease. And in that analysis of looking at why that occurred in a study of uh, over 200 patients, that group that I, I referenced had found that the PRAME marker appeared to be associated quite strongly with that. However, its role in class two is not as clear. How does that work? We think the PRAME, which is also a marker for other forms of cancer, uh, a, a uh, prognostic factor um, that is, you know, uh, demonstrates the risk of metastatic disease is probably due to a mechanism, at least as hypothesized now, is that it, it promotes a chromosomal instability. So cancers, as we know, their genetic uh, content is, um, is not normal. And so by creating a random factor that causes uh, chaos in your genetic organization, uh, you may have a, a worse outcome. And that is, is thought frame contributes to that in that fashion. So how does this affect your surveillance? I think you still have to act on an incomplete information and say, it just makes me, I'm still in a high risk group. We are still gonna monitor. Perhaps instead of every th six months, you do every three months for imaging. But I wanted to say one thing, <clears throat> you know, we're ocular oncologists and I take care of the eye, the tumor in the eye, but we work very much uh, in coordination with oncologists. Dr. Carvajal has been a leader in our field and we're looking to engage more oncologists, general oncologists into our field. Uh, it's a rare condition with 2000 cases a year occurring. So it's uh, not uncommon that the oncologist will have never seen a patient with uh, ocular melanoma when they're being asked to treat them. So we try and develop centers of excellence. So our referral pattern has been to send our patients to oncologists who have the most experience with treating this condition. And then we rely on them to make the judgment calls in terms of what advice they would do with the PRAIM information. Thank you for that. I think that that really kind of helped um, some of the, the confusion I think that can be out there around the difference. So I really appreciate that. Um, Lindsay and Paul, just real fast, wanted to ask you a question. So I think there's a lot of talk in the OM community about genetic testing. And I think that um, some people are on the fence at times and others are all for it. How, how do you handle those discussions? Um, what are some, some support and um, some, maybe some words of wisdom that you would give people? So words of wisdom, um, <laughs> you know, I would say um, this is a, a low biopsy or, you know, it's a, a, a reliable, um, you know, um, decision, but ultimately it's a personal decision. And whenever, you know, we've made decisions and whenever we've asked for like results, what are you going to do with those results? I guess is, is what I've asked myself and what I plan on doing, no matter what those results are. Um, I've always believed that knowing worst case scenario is great. And then I can, you know, work my way back when hopefully it isn't worst case scenario. So um, I would say, what are you going to do with the results? I can tell you though, what we've done with the, the results is, um, you know, I've been able to be an advocate for myself. I've been able to ensure that my medical and ocular oncologist and I were 
fully aligned um, with my scan cadence, um, also kind of the recommendations in my treatment plan. Um, and, and really the biggest thing I think of, you know, my advice of why I chose to do the biopsy is I wanted to have those results in my back pocket. Um, and whether this be, you know, realistic or not, but I felt like if I have the results in my back pocket, there are so many amazing like researchers and, um, you know, stuff that's going on in our world in regards to ocular melanoma, that if I have that piece of paper in my back pocket, who knows what new opportunities could come in the future? Are there new adjunctive clinical trials that I could join? Um, are there new, new treatments? Are there new drugs? Are there, you know, whatever it might be. And, you know, I feel blessed every single day that um, I am not and do not have metastatic disease, which is really, really awesome. Again, being a class two, um, you know, patient. But I have that piece of paper that I, I know hopefully when I, if, if that ever happens or if metastatic ever occurs, um, you know, maybe there's other options that could open up for me. So again, that's what I plan on doing with the results. I think it's up to the individual um, person of whatever the results might be, what do you plan on doing with them? And that's, that's what I've done. So lots of unknowns in the, can the cancer world for sure. Um, but I needed to know what I needed to know and, and ultimately to create the best plan for myself and for my family. So. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully that's some, you know, good advice, but ask yourself, what would you do with the results, no matter what they are first? Absolutely. Um, and I just want to be cognizant of time because I know that um, we are almost at the 145 or 145 mountain time. So 345 um, East Coast time. Um, and I just want to be cognizant of, of you, um, Lindsay and Paul and Dr. Hovland. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Um, and for those who have been entering questions in the Facebook live chat, just know that we will get those answers back to you. Um, so please feel free to ask away. We'll make sure to follow up with both uh, the Zubek family and Dr. Hovland to answer those. Um, so with that, I'd like to again extend my thanks to Dr. Hovland and the Zubek family for being part of this third Ask the Expert session. Um, really informative. I think that it was a wonderful conversation all around about genetic testing and hearing the patient and caregiver experience. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to extend a thank you to Castle Biosciences for their generosity in sponsoring this series during hashtag I get dilated awareness month. Uh, before we sign off, just want to highlight the resources that the MRF has available on our website. We do have information on genetic testing, um, so please feel free to visit melanoma.org. Uh, we have an entire section on our CureM initiative, and it provides education and resources for newly diagnosed patients, caregivers, and provides information for ongoing support services, including um, the one that Dr. Hovland mentioned that Colorado Retina Associates, the MRF, and the University of Denver has started uh, in the Rocky Mountain area. So please feel free to check that out. Uh, just another quick reminder that we are currently in the middle of our free global patient and caregiver symposium. I'm super excited. It is the 19th today through the 21st. Registration can be found on our website at curom.org. Again, this is a free event. Um, hopefully some of you can join us. And next week will be our fourth and final Ask the Expert session on Tuesday, November 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We will be joined by Dr. William Harbor from Bascom Eye Center in Miami, and he will be discussing an overview of clinical trials and research in ocular melanoma. So again, just a huge thank you to the Zubex and Dr. Hobland, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day.